right, good morning, everybody. Let's stand and sing together. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lives in high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm You'll be faithful forevermore You have done great things And I know you will do it again For your promise is yes and amen You will do great things God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captain and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dare sing your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lives in high. Done great things, and hallelujah, God above it all, hallelujah, God unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you done great things, and hallelujah. Above it all, hallelujah, God, unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, you've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave, you free every captain and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We have seen your freedom awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lives in high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh, God, you do great things. You may be seated. I don't know if I had a chance to greet everybody, but I've been gone so long, I feel like I need to introduce myself. I'm Pastor Craig. Do you all remember that? I, oh, thank you. I'm glad you remember that. I want you to know, have you, ever, have you guys heard of COVID fog? It is a true thing. People who have COVID, some of them kind of get a little foggy. And I demonstrated that at the first service. Pastor Billy nearly fell over when I demonstrated the, my COVID fog this morning because I said we're starting a new sermon series for the whole year and we're going to be doing First and Second Timothy and 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 Billy's back there going no we're not we are good. this year we're doing First and Second Corinthians so it's going to be a great sermon by the way and you're going to be excited for it I'm sure 
Uh, I'm glad you're here. Uh, if you haven't had a chance already, we, if you would pass along these uh, attendance pads, we would sure appreciate that. Are there, is there one up there? Thank you, guys. Uh, a couple of announcements I want to share with you. The first one is that this afternoon, uh, we have our, our youth uh, life group is meeting. And if you're a part of that, uh, Billy wanted me to let you know that we are meeting uh, and be a part of that. But the young adult life group, which meets tomorrow, which was going to meet tomorrow night, is going to is canceled. And the next young adult life group uh, that Billy and Ryan lead is going to be on Monday night, January seventeenth. If you need more details, let them know. But just know tomorrow's night. Tomorrow night is not going to be meeting. Um, also, want to let you know we've got this new uh, Bible study that's getting ready to start. It's the, on the Book of Acts. Pat and Ron bunch are going to be leading that. Um, and one of the things that Ron asked me to share with all of you today is we've got we've had lots of expressed interest in the um, in the morning study, as you can see on the screen, but we've not had a lot of interest expressed for the Tuesday night. Um, study on the book of Acts. So if that's something that you are intending on being a part of and you would like to be a part of it, please let me or Ron know that because if we don't get some more interest, we probably won't be doing the the Tuesday evening Acts class and we'll just focus on the the morning study, okay? So if that's something you are intended to do, just let me or Ron know and we will be making the decision based on your response, okay? Lastly, um, my wife, Lisa, and I, at Prairie Bible, we, in a lot of churches, they have what's called confirmation. It is for a particular age group of kids to, to help equip them for um, uh, life as Christians going forward. We don't, we don't call it confirmation, but we've got something similar. Um, but it's probably more, what I believe, more practical than what happens in a lot of other places. Uh, Lisa and I... Um, teach a class, and it's, it's kind of two sections we do. It. it starts in the spring, and then it finishes in the fall of the year, and we call it Equip. And it's, it's, we, are, we do it between the two services, and we meet right in my, in my uh, office. And in essence, what this class is for is to, as I said before, it is to um, give our students, our young people, um, what they will need to live vibrant um, and effective lives in Christ uh, moving forward, get equipping you with those fundamental tools of Christianity. So Lisa and I are going to be hosting a, um, an informational meeting on Sunday, January 16th, between services, and we're going to be meeting right over here at the conference table. It's the northwest corner. Uh, we have a conference table over there if you haven't been down that hallway. And it's going to be on the 16th between services, Uh, We want parents and um, kids from 7th grade and up that would like to be a part of it. If you've never been a part of something like that, we would love for you to come and we'll give you some some dates and some information that you might need to know. Um, But we would love, it's good, it's a good opportunity for her and I to get to build relationship with the students in our church. And um, if you think that that's something you'd like to do, if you've got somebody in your family that you think would benefit from something like that, we'd love to have you, okay? That's on the 16th. You'll be getting more information on it in the coming weeks. I believe that is all the announcements I have for today. If you'd bow your heads, let's pray as we continue into worship. Lord, thank you for the beautiful sunshine. It's cold out there, but the sun is shining and we can feel the warmth of your Holy Spirit in this place today. We ask that you would move in a mighty and powerful way that, that the songs of praise that we Uh, lift up would be acceptable in your sight. And I want to pray a special anointing on um, Pastor Billy as he brings the word today as we begin this new journey through um, the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We pray, Lord Jesus, that that, um, our hearts would be open and that we would be transformed by the time we spend with you um, and, and the time we spend in your word getting to be more like you. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you in your holy name. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand and continue our worship together. I'll search the world, but it could fill me. There's empty praise and treasures that fade. I never enough 
then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you know there's nothing than you know there's nothing nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord seen them all and you still call me friend cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's not better than you know there's nothing better than you know there's nothing nothing is better than you you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into goddess you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who can oh there's no Better than you know, there's nothing. Better than you know, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you know, there's nothing. Better than you know, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into goddess. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some million sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I come And I hope by thy good pleasure 
safely to arrive at home. Jesus of me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger and to his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God. My heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You all can be seated. Well, good morning, church family, and happy snowy new year. Uh, I'm happy to report to all of you that my wife came back with me from Arizona. Wasn't quite sure when we saw the forecast, but I hope you all had a a blessed Christmas, uh, a blessed New Year, and so excited to open up God's Word with you. Uh, First, I just wanted to thank Matt Grimm. He's not here right now, but Matt, thank you for leading the prayer and praise service last week. You did a great job. Uh, I appreciated the testimony you gave about keeping a good attitude despite a difficult Christmas season. So if I could have the kids come up now, we are going to pray over our kids. And if you're new to Prairie Bible, we like to extend a hand over our kids and pray for them as we dismiss them. We've got a lot more at 10 than we did at 8.30. All right, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for our kids Thank you for this local body, this church that allows them to come in here and learn about the name of Jesus and to learn about your word. Would you please bless them in class, bless their instructors, and guide them by your Holy Spirit. And as we open up your word here for the sermon, would you bless our time in your word? We acknowledge our humble dependence on you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys are dismissed. Also, if you're new here, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Billy. I'm the associate pastor here. And uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, this is page 1131 of the Bibles under your chairs. Uh, We celebrate at PBC when our Bibles go missing, so feel free to keep that Bible as our gift to you. The message this morning is titled, Called to be Saints called to be saints. We are beginning a series in 1st and 2nd Corinthians this year. Uh, Today's message is going to be a little bit different. Um, It's going to be more teaching than preaching because we are going to open up with some context about the Corinthian church and some context about the Corinthian culture in order to understand this entire uh, series that we're going to be teaching through Corinthians this year. Maybe you're asking the question, why Corinthians? Why did we choose this as the book we're going to study this year? Well, 1 Corinthians was likely written between 53 and 55 AD, and it was written by the Apostle Paul. And I just say that to say that this was not a church that had been around for centuries when Paul wrote to them. They were a young, new church. Now, some of you here and online that are listening uh, may have come out of denominations or churches that have been around for a very long time. 
But the reality is, at Prairie Bible Church, we are still very young, just like the Corinthian church was very young. We are just over four years old. We are surrounded by a secular worldly culture, and we are still learning what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ in the area where he's planted us. And so we have so much to learn from this church in Corinth. First, let's talk about the Corinthian church. I want to give you a little context about this letter. Uh, Paul stayed with this church for 18 months, so for a year and a half. And we're told that in Acts 18.11, when it says he stayed a year and six months at Corinth, teaching the word of God among them. And so this is a very long stay. The only church he wrote to where he stayed longer than this was the church in Ephesus. This was also Paul's lengthiest correspondence among New Testament churches. He wrote 29 chapters to the church at Corinth. Uh, Many scholars believe that Paul actually wrote four letters to the church at Corinth. Uh, One scholar even suggested maybe five, but two of them survived. So Paul stayed with this church a long time. He wrote a lot to this church. And this is also understood to be Paul's most personal correspondence among New Testament churches. That is specific to 2 Corinthians. So if you have read 2 Corinthians, that is where Paul talks about his thorn in the flesh. Uh, He talks about the many weaknesses and calamities he faced in his ministry. And he also defends his apostolic ministry uh, to this church. So Paul had a very pastoral relationship with this church. And last, uh, this church is primarily Gentile converts. Okay, that means non-Jewish. And that's important to understand what's going on here. Because uh, I am teaching the youth, for example, uh, on the book of James. Okay, and the book of James is primarily written to Jewish Christians. We just taught a little bit in the book of Matthew, and Matthew is primarily written to Jewish Christians. But the church at Corinth, uh, these letters that Paul writes, is primarily written to Gentile Christians, to Christians who are coming out of a secular world with no understanding of the Mosaic law like the Jews had, and they are trying to learn to live like Christ. And in order to illustrate this, I just want to share two pitfalls that we tend to fall into as Christians. Okay, so let's say you're a Christian, you are walking down a road. If staying on the road is is faithfulness, there's typically two pitfalls or two ditches, one on each side of the road that we tend to fall into as Christians. I would call the first one legalism. Okay, we've all, many of us have heard that word, legalism. I would define it as trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ's finished work for a right standing before God, okay? So the Pharisees fell into the trap of legalism, right? They took God's word, they added over 600 rules to it, and they started playing a religious scorekeeping game, uh, thinking of themselves as having a better standing before God because of their ability to keep the rules. That's one ditch. The other ditch... This is the ditch that the Corinthians appear to be falling into constantly in this letter is is licentiousness, okay? That's a big word. There's the spelling right up there. Um, But this is a word for license. And this means to disregard all moral restraints. Okay, so how we see this in our culture today is maybe when someone under the guise of freedom in Christ Uh, goes far beyond the bounds of what God has instructed us uh, and just throws off all moral restraint. And what Paul is going to be teaching this church is that there are certain ways we are called to live to be a testimony to Jesus Christ as the church of Christ to those around us. Now, why would the Corinthians fall into that, that ditch or that pitfall of licentiousness? Well, we need to understand the culture to understand why that would happen to them. The city of Corinth was a Roman city strategically placed where there was a lot of tourism and a lot of trade. So there was tons of people flowing into Corinth and that meant that there was a lot of money or wealth and there was a lot of sin or worldliness. Uh, Corinth was a city that worshipped several gods. The culture was overly sexualized. Uh, In fact, the term Corinthian became synonymous with the term immoral. So if someone called you a Corinthian in this day, they were calling you a morally filthy person, 
Okay, so Corinth had big time issues with sin and moral filth. Anthony Tizzleton, in his commentary on the Corinthian culture, says this, and pay attention to how similar this sounds to our American culture. The Corinthian culture was characterized by an obsessive concern to win reputation and status in the eyes of others, self-promotion to gain applause and influence, ambition to succeed, often by manipulating networks of power, and above all, an emphasis on autonomy and rights. Does that sound familiar? And here are some of the things that their culture valued. The Corinthian culture highly valued status. Uh, The Roman culture was a status-hungry, a status-obsessed culture. Similar to how a a tree has a vine that would attach itself to it, and the vine would wrap itself around the tree and climb the tree, as one scholar put it. Uh, That's a similar analogy to how people in Corinth would attach themselves to wealthy patrons to garner a greater name for themselves. This was a culture wrapped up in self-promotion. Uh, As a Roman city, this was what we call an honor-shame culture. Okay, the the veil, the thin veil between uh, life and death was was very, very thin, paper thin in Roman thinking. It was a, a military state. People died often in the military. But what was thought of to be the best thing you could do is to garner honor for yourself, even if that meant an honorable death. And so it was an honor-shame culture where the worst possible thing that could happen to you was to be dishonored or shamed. And you can see why the gospel that Paul was preaching was so upside down to them because they thought that way. This was a culture uh, wrapped up in persuasive public speech. In 1 Corinthians 10, they said about Paul, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. You know, they looked down on Paul because he wasn't this big, eloquent man. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So when Paul walked into this culture, he purposefully didn't come with eloquent speech. Rather, he came just preaching the cross. This was a culture that highly valued powerful personalities. Uh, Paul, when addressing the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 11, said this to them uh, with a rebuke. He said, You gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. Paul is saying, I've come with love to love you and to sacrifice for you, so why do you love me less, and why do you put up with people who make slaves of you? But isn't this so similar to our culture? Don't we live in a celebrity culture that values status and self-promotion and eloquent speech and powerful personalities? Well, the church in Corinth struggled with the same things. Here are some of the things that the the Corinthian culture devalued. First of all, uh, they devalued tradition. They devalued tradition. So this is similar in in our culture today where there's uh, institutions and tradition and structures are viewed with skepticism, right? We think this way a lot in our culture. They also devalued truth and fact, okay? They they didn't value the truth uh, as much as they valued the ability to win a platform and to win applause. Uh, A good example of this is if there were two Corinthians uh, in a public debate against each other, uh, what would be more valuable to them would be winning the crowd than telling the truth, Okay, they were more concerned with winning applause and a platform and its status than dealing with the facts of a situation. So again, these things that the Corinthian culture valued make it very similar to the postmodern age that we live in in America. We saw this, this idea in, in the Corinthian culture actually with Pontius Pilate. So Pontius Pilate was a Roman, just like the city of Corinth was a Roman city. And if you remember the scene... Uh, when Pontius Pilate is questioning Jesus, 
One of the things he says to Jesus is, what is truth, right? Because there wasn't a high value placed on truth. Again, this is similar to our culture where we will often hear things uh, that relativize the truth, such as people saying, this is my truth, or this is your truth, rather than saying, this is the truth, right? And so this is the culture, the worldly culture of the city of Corinth to which this church of Corinth was being founded. But I have good news amidst all of this bad news, and that is the grace of of God, the magnificent grace of God we see in Acts 18, verses 8 through 10. This is when Paul was visiting the city of Corinth. It says, Many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul, One night in a vision, Do not be afraid, go on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. And listen to these words that Jesus said to Paul, for I have many in this city who are my people. Because as one scholar put it, holiness is received, it's not achieved. Christ did not plant a church in this city because these people were so holy and so good and so righteous. Rather, by the grace of God, Christ sent Paul to stay with the city for a long time and pastor them and teach them what it meant to live like Christ. And we're going to see that all throughout this year as we study this church. If you're taking notes, we are going to look at three ways this morning that these first 17 verses teach us what it means to be the church of Jesus Christ. And the first one is this. The church of Jesus Christ is called to be holy. Called to be holy. Let me read the first three verses for us. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 1, Paul establishes his authority as an apostle. Okay? And notice how he, he says it. Does he say that he has volunteered to be an apostle? No. Does he say that he chose this? No. He says he is compelled to be an apostle by the will of God. He is called to be an apostle. And why is Paul establishing his authority? Well, Paul is shepherding this new young church. And just like a parent has to gently and lovingly correct a child at times, Paul is going to have to use the shepherd's staff throughout this letter to gently and lovingly correct Um, the church of Corinth. Okay, so the picture I want you to have is this. One of the roles of a shepherd is not just uh, to love the sheep, or I would say another manifestation of the way a shepherd loves the sheep is to protect them. So when a sheep is going astray, uh, the shepherd might have to take his, his staff and give a gentle little yap to the sheep to get it to go back in the right direction. And because this church was struggling with many different manifestations of sin and ungodliness, Paul is often going to have to take out that shepherd's staff and correct them. But this is important, whether you're a parent or you're a shepherd in God's church. uh, Paul always does this lovingly, gently, and for building up. Not harshly or punitively, not to punish If there is a shepherd that takes his staff and abuses and beats the sheep, that is a grievous sin against God. We are called to gently and lovingly correct each other as the body of Christ. In verse 2, Paul says to the church at Corinth that they are called to be saints. So he says, just as I've been called to be an apostle, called to be a spiritual parent to all of you, um, he says, you are also called to be saints. And what this word saints means is holy. It means set apart. So Paul affirms at the beginning of this letter that they belong to Christ. But then he says, even though you belong to Christ, I encourage you to continue to walk in a way 
where you are becoming more and more like Christ. Think of it this way. Uh, When we come to Christ, we are justified in Christ. That means we are declared righteous before God. So when you give your life to Christ, uh, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. You can pray to God, not covered in the filthy rags of your own self-righteousness, but now covered by the blood of Christ. We are declared righteous. We receive that holiness. But if you've been called to Christ, you are also called to the process of sanctification, which is the progressively becoming more like Christ. And so what Paul is saying is, you have been justified in Christ, now continue to be sanctified in Christ. Continue to become more and more holy, more and more set apart from your surrounding culture. In verse 3, he says to them, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you've read Paul's letters... Paul always says grace to you in peace. Now notice this. He always puts grace before peace. He doesn't say peace and grace. He says grace and peace. Now why does he do that? Because if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've lived in this world long enough and you've seen your own sin and how many times we fall on our face, we know that our peace in Jesus Christ is not dependent on us. It's dependent on the grace of God. It is the grace of the finished work of Jesus Christ that has granted us a peace that only Jesus Christ has because peace belongs to him. And in that grace, we are called to be holy, just as the church in Corinth was called to be holy. The church of Jesus Christ is called to be holy, and next, the church of Jesus Christ is called to be gifted. Let's look at verses 4 through 9. Paul says this, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful, by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, just as Paul has greeted the church in Corinth, he has reminded them of who they are and how they're connected to the larger church. Now, Paul is thanking God for them. And again, we get a wonderful lesson from Paul about what it means to be a shepherd or a parent. Because Paul affirms what is good in them before correcting them. Paul thanks God for the Corinthians' spiritual gifts. Now, this is very, very interesting because what we are going to see in this letter is one of the primary ways uh, the, the Corinthian church was getting it wrong. In fact, one of the primary ways that they were at odds with Paul was through their use or really their abuse of the spiritual gifts. The Bible says that the calls and gifts of God are irrevocable. What that means is that when God gifts us in Christ, we can use those gifts for the building up of the church or we can abuse those gifts for our own selfish means. And that's what the Corinthians were so often doing in this letter with the spiritual gifts God had given them. But pay attention to Paul's discernment here. Because even though they're abusing these gifts, Paul doesn't throw the baby out with the bathwater He doesn't say they're all bad, or he doesn't go straight into correcting them and attacking their wrong use of the spiritual gifts. Rather, he says, I thank God that you have this very good thing. Even though you're using it wrong, I thank God that he's given you this very good thing. And this is a lesson, I think, for all of us in how we exercise the gift of discernment. Okay, so one of the spiritual gifts that we are told about is the gift of discernment. This is called the testing of the spirits, right? The testing between spirits. And from my brothers and sisters in Christ that I've talked to who seem to really have this gift, um, I've learned that it's often viewed by others as a critical spirit, right? So some of you might be very gifted with discernment and maybe you come into a church service or into a church body and you immediately see everything wrong with it. Well, maybe you have the gift of discernment and God is calling you to help correct that church body. And I don't think that God is asking you to not correct 
or to just uh, diminish that gift or not use it. The Bible says that we are to fan into flame the gift of God that is in us. But Paul, who had that gift, notice how he uses it. He teaches us how to avoid uh, the, the view that we have a critical spirit by how he handles the church in Corinth. Uh, He is going to be correcting this church for many chapters, but he opens these nine verses by greeting them, affirming them in Christ, thanking God for them. I also see a close connection here between grace and spiritual gifts. Okay, so when I think of grace, typically, I think of uh, the blood of Jesus Christ shed for me, the unmerited favor I have received as forgiveness of sin, which is certainly grace. But that's not the only type of grace we've received. In fact, Paul points out here that a primary evidence of the grace of God and the church at Corinth is their spiritual gifts. Because we're not only called to be holy, we are called to be gifted. It's a major mark of the church. In fact, if if you are in a church where uh, there is no manifestation of any spiritual gift, uh, any any proper teaching or building up or service or all the gifts listed for us, that's a major red flag that the Holy Spirit might not be in that church. Another reason we know there's a, a major connection between grace and spiritual gifts is because the word for grace is the Greek word charis, charis. And the word used for gifts is charismata, okay? That's where we get the word charisma. And so charis, charismata, Uh, The the original languages directly connect grace and spiritual gifts because just as the church in Corinth uh, was very gifted in the spiritual gifts, they needed to learn how to use them rightly, but just as they were gifted in the spiritual gifts and that was an evidence of Christ in them, so we at Prairie Bible Church, as a major evidence that we are in Christ, will be gifted uh, with spiritual gifts And just as we're called to be holy, we're called to be gifted and to fan those gifts into a flame and to use those gifts in your local body, in the church. The church of Jesus Christ is called to be holy. The church of Jesus Christ is called to be gifted. And third, the church of Jesus Christ is called to be united. And so Paul here is going to turn his attention from greeting and affirming them now to correcting some of the wrongs in their behavior. Let's look at verses 10 through 17. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, that's Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So the Corinthian church was struggling big time with divisions. The word here for divisions is schismata. This is where we get the word schism. Okay, so there are schisms in the body of Christ. Now, we talked about that this culture was status obsessed, status hungry, and how people would attach themselves to wealthy patrons to climb the ladder of society. Well, that same thinking had made its way into the church at Corinth. Because the seeming pillars or the seemingly powerful Christians, uh, such as Paul or Apollos or Peter, uh, are being attached to, the the Corinthians are latching onto them and saying, I follow him or I follow him. And uh, they are literally tearing the body of Christ asunder because we are the body of Christ as the church. And when we cause unnecessary division in our churches, we tear the body of Christ apart which is not a very good testimony to the world around us. 
Now, we can't know for sure what each group was saying. Maybe the group that said they followed Paul was, was saying he planted this church, so we follow him. Uh, maybe, the church, maybe the people that were following Apollos uh, were saying he's an eloquent speaker. Uh, we know that Apollos was an eloquent speaker from the book of Acts. Uh, maybe the ones who were following Peter were saying he's the rock that Christ is building the church on, so we're following him. And then maybe the group that was saying we're following Christ was saying uh, we're the true Christians, right? We're the only ones who have it right. We're the only ones who are following Christ. But as Paul points out, this division is, is bringing shame to the name of Christ in their community. But lest we're too hard on them, I mean, don't we see this in our culture big time and in our churches in America? I think at one level, uh, the many denominations or the many church planning organizations we see should lead us to at least reflection, if not some deep repentance uh, for how little division we have. But I want to exercise nuance here on this because I realize that many of us here have come out of other church planning organizations or other denominations. I do not believe this means that we remain in a place where the central tenets of the Christian faith have been compromised. I truly do not think that's what this is saying. Uh, maybe, maybe you've been in a place where Christ and the gospel uh, are not lifted up as the main thing, and uh, after much suffering and pain, maybe you've left that place, and that's a little bit different than what Paul is talking about here. I do think what he's talking about, though, is that we should not treat the church as consumers where we are quick to leave a church body based on shallow preferences. Because that's a major issue in our culture. So we need to exercise wisdom and discernment when we approach uh, where we're going to call our church home. Within our church body at Prairie Bible, what I would say about this is that unity does not mean uniformity. Okay, Unity does not mean uniformity. Here's what I mean. When sin and corruption enter Prairie Bible Church, our church body, as it inevitably will, because we are made up of sinners saved by grace. Uh, this does not mean that we remain silent uh, because that's more comfortable, okay? There's certain churches you'll be in where if you raise any concern, even if it's a valid concern, uh, it's, it's treated as causing dissension or sowing seeds of dissension. And that is not what Paul is talking about. We are called uh, to, to identify sin identify corruption in the church body, and to drive it out so that we might remain a pure bride to Christ. But Paul uses these words. He says, we are called to be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Now what that means is that we are called to be united on the main things at Prairie Bible Church. So Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the only way to the Father. God is a Trinitarian God. Uh, the gospel is what saves. I mean, these are the main tenets of our faith. And we are called to be united on the main things. Being just over four years old here at Prairie Bible Church, um, if you've been in church long enough, you know that one of the major ways the enemy wants to tear down the church of Christ is through division, unnecessary division. He was doing that in Corinth, and we always need to be on guard against that at Prairie Bible Church. You know, Jesus Christ addressed this same uh, situation actually in his high priestly prayer. So John 17, verses 21 through 23, um, this whole chapter of John 17 is a prayer called the high priestly prayer of Christ before he goes to the cross. It's a magnificent chapter of scripture. And as I read this, I want you to pay attention to how many times Jesus Christ prays to the Father for our unity in the church. He says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. What we see in these verses, in this high priestly prayer, is Jesus constantly connecting our unity to our testimony. 
One of the major testimonies that Prairie Bible Church can have to our greater community around us is a proper unity, uh, being united in the same mind and the same judgment. And may we strive for that at Prairie Bible Church. Amen? Another way we've seen this in our culture, and I'm sure you've all seen this too, is in names, right? We have a celebrity church culture. Uh, Certain people will follow one name. uh, Certain people will follow another name. And uh, I also want to exercise nuance here and, and try to think wisely about this topic. Because you may be drawn to certain teachers and pastors more than others. I can say for myself, um, there are certain teachers that have played a very significant role in building me up in the body of Christ. And there's certain teachers that maybe I'm not as drawn to or I don't learn as much from. So I don't think that's wrong. In fact, Jesus said, or excuse me, Paul said in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12 that Jesus Christ himself gave the church Apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. Okay, so we, we want to avoid too low a view of ministry that says that uh, we don't need anybody to teach us, we don't need any pastors. But I want to uh, show nuance in that too because First John 2, John says this to us. He says, the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it is taught you, abide in him. So on one hand, we have uh, Jesus Christ himself appointing certain people as his agents to build up the church. On the other hand, we have the Apostle John saying, really, your only teacher is the Holy Spirit. And so I think a proper view of ministry recognizes that Christ has appointed certain people as agents to carry out his work and to build up the church. But while important, these people are not some type of mediator between you and God. You have one mediator, that is Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit guides you into all the truth through the word of God. And the way I think I've seen this is I know that certain people would come to me or Pastor Craig and say something along the lines of, we want you to pray for us because we know that God hears you. And I just want to say, uh, we are always happy to be there for you and to pray for you, and we rejoice in teaching you the word of God, but never think that you need me or Pastor Craig or any priest or any pastor or any other Christian uh, to stand between you and Christ. You have the same direct line to God through Christ that we have And he loves you just as much as, as, he loves us just as much uh, as he loves you. So in conclusion, uh, we are called to be saints. The church of Jesus Christ is called to be holy. We are called to be gifted and we are called to be united. And may we be that here at Prairie Bible Church. Band, you can come up. I just want to close with this. Uh, We are diving in to a couple letters that are going to greatly challenge our walk with Christ. It's going to weed out sin in our lives. It's going to challenge and admonish us in areas that maybe uh, we still need to grow in. But let me just say this. God's commands are are a fence, not a prison. Does that make sense? God's commands are a fence, not a prison. You know, I grew up in church, and I think when I was young, I often thought of God's commands as a prison to just take all the fun out of my life. But after walking with God uh, for a little while, I can tell you that I've learned that really they're a fence. Uh, God's commands are a fence from a loving God who wants to shield and protect us from an enemy who wants to steal, kill, and destroy our soul. And God has provided a fence for us to give us the best life possible and so that we avoid unnecessary pain. And so as we receive uh, Paul's corrections through Christ throughout this year, just remember that God's commands are a fence, not a prison. The first step to become a part of, of Jesus Christ and his church is to confess that he is Lord, to believe that God has raised him from the dead, to repent and turn from your sin 
and believe that Jesus Christ was really a man that lived 2,000 years ago, died on the cross for our sins, but didn't remain in the grave. He rose again where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And if you've never made that decision, that's the best decision you can make. And you can become a part of the church of Jesus Christ. As Adam leads us in worship as we close, I'll be over in the prayer room if any of you needs prayer. Who am I that the highest king could welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, oh His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me, whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am, in my Father's house. There's a place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me Sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. As I listened to uh, the teaching that God inspired Billy to share with us today, I was reminded that um, the old uh, that old saying that says, uh, um, "As much as things change, things are really the same." Sometimes I read the Bible and I go, "You know, is there any possible way that that God's word or this old book, thousands and thousands of years old, some of it?" Is it, is it has truth that affects me or that I can apply to my life today? As I'm listening to um, the teaching and some of the history that, that he shared with us today, I'm going, 
we haven't changed one bit, you guys. The truths of God are just as applicable to our lives today as they were 2,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, which says that you have been equipped with everything you can possibly need to go into tomorrow and the next day and the next day with, with victory um, and with hope. Even in the midst of your brokenness, you have hope. Because Jesus loves you. He's gifted you, and he's given you grace, and he has, he has uh, equipped you with all the things that you will need to be Jesus to the world. So, as you uh, prepare to leave this place today, remember that as much as things change, they really don't change that much. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And he has called you to share his hope and his truth to the world. Amen? Amen. Thanks for coming today. Happy New Year. It's good to have you guys. Breathe out. No more drinking.